Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, ODRL and WriteSML. Um, so uh, these are um, the ways that we've developed for um, expressing permissions and restrictions for the publishing industry. Um, so my name is Stuart Miles. Um, I'm the director of schema standards at the Associated Press. Um, that means I get to um, do all kinds of work within AP to do with XML and formats uh, for all kinds of content and metadata. Um, it also means that I uh, represent AP to the IPTC. So IPTC is a, um, a standards body uh, consisting of um, many different um, uh, participants in the news and the publishing industry from around the world. So um, many of you in this room are uh, obviously members of IPTC, um, but it's uh, important to emphasize that IPTC um, works with and works on behalf of um, publishers of, at all different levels and all different uh, um, participants within the publishing industry. So I want to talk a little bit about the news industry need for uh, machine readable rights. Um, as was mentioned earlier this morning, um, partly this has been driven by um, increasing automation. As budgets um, shrink, sadly, um, there's fewer people um, to work directly with content. There's increasing um, automation. So the traditional way uh, for expressing rights in uh, most um, news content is in the form of editor's notes. Right. So as we publish um, content for ourselves or on behalf of our partners, um, the idea is that we'll, keep, we'll put some notes in that may relate to why this content was updated or um, the fact that it's um, uh, not to be distributed uh, in a particular country or that you have to credit somebody and so on. Um, unfortunately, if there are fewer and fewer people, the fact is that there's fewer and fewer editors to read those editors' notes. And more often, uh, we have completely automated publishing workflows. Um, so we felt that um, within IPTC, we felt that that meant we need to have um, a way to express those rights in a machine-readable way. Um, also, um, there's more, in, uh, I guess, the traditional relationships between publishers are um, evolving, uh, in some cases eroding. Um, there, I think it used to be the case, uh, much more so than today, um, where you'd have essentially um, straight through channels, single purpose um, ways of publishing from this particular publisher to a particular client uh, that would go into a particular publication, for a newspaper or a magazine, for example. Um, more and more centralization uh, in the industry means that um, uh, publishers, um, including ourselves, want to make use of the same piece of content ac uh, across multiple different publications for multiple different uses. Um, they want to use it on the website, on mobile apps, and so on. Um, also, um, as George was mentioning earlier this morning, uh, there's also the increasingly um, a desire to have more flexible relationships between um, publishers and uh, consumers of content in the sense of we don't necessarily want to have the, uh, the big heavyweight relationships be the only way that um, people can get content and distribute it. So in order to do that, uh, we need a more flexible way, a more ad hoc way of being able to distribute content um, in a way that um, still respects the rights, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the rights of the rights holders, the content creators. So uh, given all of these industry forces, IPC decided that we needed to tackle uh, rights expression for all kinds of content. What we did was we looked at a number of different um, uh, existing uh, rights expression languages and frameworks because uh, IPTC uh, feels confident in creating uh, news standards, but we didn't feel that we wanted to um, or, or that it was necessary to create an entirely new um, standard for rights. So what we did was we identified um, ODRL, which is the Open Digital Rights Language. Um, which is now a, a community group hosted by the W3C as the framework that um, we wanted to use to express rights. And it's very flexible and it lets you, it's actually used by a number of different industries, not just uh, us. Um, and it um, is designed for industries to take and specialize for their needs. So RightsML is the new specific, the publishing industry specific vocabulary that we've developed to plug into the ODRL framework. 
And right now, we've uh, uh, about a year ago, uh, we released WriteSML 1.0 into what we're calling an experimental phase, because what we want is for people to start to use the standard and to uh, give us feedback on does it actually meet their needs, or the things that need to be clarified or added um, in order to make it um, um, uh, fully uh, production ready. And um, as part of that work, we've also started to work with um, an effort called the Linked Content Coalition, um, which Jeff was mentioning as well, and which I believe we're going to hear from um, later today. In fact, yeah. Okay. Um, so what I thought I would do um, is to give you a, um, a, an insight into um, the three principles that we used in developing WriteSML, and um, also uh, what we're seeing as uh, sort of the three different ways that people are adopting it. Um, so what we wanted to do for the first principle was really we wanted um, it to be a publishing specific rights expression language. So really very much focused on um, our needs in, in the publishing industry. But at the same time we didn't want to completely reinvent the wheel. So that's why we uh, wanted to use the ODRL framework that had been um, a, a huge amount of development had been taken place in as a, as a, as a general purpose rights expression uh, for permissions and restrictions and duties and it's very expressive. Um, but we wanted to make sure that it met the needs specifically for the news in the publishing industry. Um, in the process, we, it's uh, uh, become clearer to me that it's actually quite difficult to um, define exactly what the publishing industry is. Um, and we sort of heard a little bit of that today. I think that um, there's, um, uh, it, it fringes off into uh, a number of related areas. Um, and in fact, we found that um, the ODRL people are very willing to work with us um, to incorporate feedback and to extend, um, um, extend the uh, standard in ways that um, work specifically for us, because it also works for other people too. There's a lot of commonality, it turns out, in um, different kinds of permissions and restrictions. Um, one thing I want to emphasize is that, again, the, the, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. That's why we went with ODRL as an existing framework. Um, because we thought that would help pave the way for adoption. Um, if there's already a standard, it's more likely that tool vendors um, would want to uh, implement it and that, um, uh, you know, as we know, if, if, the, if a content management um, people ha have some kind of support um, for a standard, it's more likely that um, uh, publishers will actually end up using it. Um, the second thing that we wanted to do was to balance the need to support um, the ability to express the kind of restrictions that are in use today, but also to have um, um, a view on where we think um, people want to go with uh, res uh, expressing restrictions and permissions. Um, so essentially what we did was we looked at a very large number of existing real world restrictions. So we looked across different media types. We looked at um, online video and broadcast video and photos and text. And um, we also looked at um, some of the most sophisticated things are to do with, for example, sports data. Um, as, uh, as was actually uh, referred to earlier if, if there's, um, today, there's a lot of restrictions, as you know, on um, the ways in which you can use sports-related content. So we try to use that as a way to say, okay, well, make sure that the, the RightsML language is able to express all of those kinds of restrictions that we see today already. And then we extrapolated from that to say, okay, it looks like these are the kinds of things that people want to be able to permit and restrict and constrain and require. So there's a lot of um, duties that need to be expressed as well. And we said, okay, let's look at um, the likely ways that we want to extend that into the future. Without, um, so we'll try to strike a balance between those two um, needs. And the third principle was, um, uh, we wanted to make it sophisticated. So again, a lot of rights expressions uh, today are extremely complicated, as uh, Jeff was actually just illustrating. Um, so it needs to be um, a sophisticated rights. The rights ML language needs to be sophisticated. But we also wanted to try to make it so that it's not too um, too much of a scary standard, um, because we think that's a hurdle for people adopting it. Um, so we're trying again, trying to uh, strike that balance between making it. Um, sufficiently expressive and uh, not too uh, off-putting. So those are the three principles um, that we've uh, tried to follow in developing RightsML. Um, now I just want to briefly touch on the sort of three different ways that I see people um, looking to adopt um, rights expression and rights expression languages like RightsML. Um, and one is to start at the edge. So what I mean by that is um, 
for um, companies like um, AP, we distribute content to an awful lot of people. We have um, more or less structured information about how to express rights internally. Um, but what we've done is we've built ways to translate from that or at the point of delivery to a particular customer into RightsML. And so that's um, very much a, um, a, a reasonable use case for some clients who have more sophisticated needs. They want to uh, work automatically with rights expression. So we don't have to... Uh, in that particular case, for example, AP has not had to adopt RightsML throughout its entire workflow yet. Uh, we're able to deliver it just in time. Um, second strategy is um, to start in the middle. Um, what I mean by that is, um, again, using AP as an example, um, we ourselves aggregate content from a number of different people. We need to also respect the rights of the content that we're acquiring and that we use for our editorial purposes. Right? So just because we have a photo um, from somebody that does not mean that we can publish it. Right? Um, same sort of thing, like we'll take um, feeds of content from, um, uh, from various other news publishers to help uh, keep our editorial staff informed, but that doesn't mean that we're allowed to then um, directly make use of that sort of content. So we ourselves need to respect rights as well. So, and I'm sure uh, many of us uh, in this room have the same sort of need. So it could be that that's where you really want to focus first is on your um, adopting rights um, in, a, in a machine readable way is to actually solve your own internal uh, rights management needs as well. And really though, the third thing is just to start somewhere. Um, um, as has sort of been said earlier a couple times now, is that you don't necessarily have to solve everything in order to, uh, to, uh, in order to be able to do it. Uh, because it, that is, I think it's become clear today, um, hearing from a number of different people, how many different uh, entities are involved um, in the publishing workflow and that need to exchange rights and need to respect rights. Um, so um, what we have found anyway is that starting somewhere, even relatively small, um, with rights expression and rights ML in particular um, means you can get some value right away and um, it, it inevitably means that, um, that we're building on that success to uh, move the rights ML into other parts of our publishing workflow. Um, so think about, so for example, we started in, um, with online video as one particular case because we had particular customers who, particularly, who really wanted, really needed um, to have the rights expression uh, properly satisfied. So we started there and we've grown it from there in various different ways. So um, some of your more sophisticated customers are probably more ready than others uh, to work with rights. There's certain media types there that, um, that are much more um, uh, tractable for uh, working with rights. So. Um, Start somewhere and grow the adoption. And that's it. Thank you.